our natural condition, we are equally vulnerable to one another, um, and no one has been specially singled out to, to rule. Okay, um, paragraph three. From this equality of ability arises equality of hope in attaining our ends. So all of us have desires, things that we take to be good. We are all roughly um, competent, equally competent in paragraph 3, page 75. Equal hope in attaining our ends. And therefore, here's the key, and therefore, if any two men desire the same thing, which nevertheless they cannot both enjoy, they become enemies. Okay, so here we have a kind of assumption of scarcity, or moderate scarcity, or limited scarcity, perhaps. Um, and when we think about scarcity, so the point is, in the case where two people have the desire for a thing which they both can't enjoy, so the things available to satisfy their desires are limited. There's not enough to satisfy all of everyone's desires. And in that case, um, they're going to become enemies. They are going to disagree with one another about, I can put it this way, about who should get that thing, who should enjoy that thing, whose desire should be satisfied. What is the more valuable arrangement? I say it's good for me to get the coconut. You say it's good for you to get the coconut. So we have a disagreement in our evaluation of the two states of affairs, the one where I get the coconut and the other where you get the coconut. Right? I think the state of affairs where I get it is better. You think the state of affairs where you get it is better. And we become enemies in that sense. Um, Scarcity. Scar the concept of scarcity, that you should be aware, is a kind of relational uh, concept. It has to do both with the availability of resources relative to the desires that uh, people have. So that if resources were extremely abundant, there wouldn't be scarcity. But notice also that if desires were very, very limited, there might not be scarcity also, even with a relatively modest amount of goods. So scarcity is relative uh, to both resources and desires. I, I stopped in the middle of that sentence because he says then, and therefore if any two men desire the same thing, which nevertheless they cannot both enjoy, they become enemies. So, scarce resources relative to their desires. And in the way to their end, on the way to their goals, on the way to satisfying their desires, on a, the way to doing what they believe to be good, which is principally their own conservation and sometimes their delectation only, they will endeavor to destroy or subdue one another. Okay, so when there's scarcity, where there's going to be conflict, we're going to endeavor to destroy or subdue the other person, prevent them from doing what they have a desire to do, but which would interfere with my satisfying my desire. That's what subduing them means in this case. But notice also he sort of smuggled in an assumption here about what kinds of desires people typically have. Most importantly, their own conservation. The most important desire that Hobbes thinks everybody has is to survive, to stay alive. That's the most important desire, that maybe the strongest desire that people in fact have. They also want their delectation. They also want to satisfy other desires as well. 
but he singles this one out as especially important. We can assume that everybody thinks their own death would be bad. That is, everybody has an aversion to death. Especially their own survival. And therefore, he says, hence, it comes to pass that where an invader hath no more to fear than another man's single power, if one plant so build or possess a convenient seat, then others may probably be expected to come prepared with forces united to dispossess and deprive him, not only of the fruit of his labor, but also of his life or liberty. And the invader, again, is in like danger of another. So this he calls diffidence or distrust. Um, and his point is this. Um, his point is this, that, the, that when there is a conflict over some scarce resource, well, that's going to be something that will lead people to try to subdue one another, to prevent the other person from preventing you from <coughs> doing what's good, satisfying your desire. So when there's a scarce resource, and there's, that is, when there's a scarce resource, that is, there's a conflict between two people over how that scarce resource is going to be used, they're going to try to subdue one another. There's going to be a fight. <coughs> so let me just pause one moment to remind you of um, that there is one, there are two other possibilities. So when there's a scarce resource, one possibility is for me not to satisfy my desire and let you have the coconut and you walk away. Right? Now, that's not satisfying my desire, so for me, I would say that's bad. That's a possibility. Um, the possibility that he's talking about here is, of course, fighting. My grabbing it from you and running away. You tackling me and bashing me over the head and taking it back. There's one other possibility that I mentioned here. What's that? Share it. Huh? Share it. Uh, there's scarce resources. So then we're assuming there's not enough to be able to share it. Right? I mean, so the assumption here is this is important. Nobody gets it. The assumption here is that there's scarce resources. That we, that we can't satisfy our desires for. We can't both satisfy our desires for. But, but there's another possibility that Hobbes doesn't mention here. Yeah. Third person. A third person. What was the third person then? The judge. Right, so we could agree with one another not to fight over it, but to just rely on somebody else's judgment who happens to be walking by. We'll say whatever he desires, will take to be right reason, will act as if that was good, and abide by that. Hobbes doesn't mention this here, but that's going to be his solution. Okay, um, right, sorry. So in this first case, we have scarce resources, and we know that in the absence of a third party, there's no way to resolve this <laughs> except fight or <coughs> one of us one of us win, which really isn't so different than fighting. There's no real resolution here. But now Hobbes observes that knowing that this is the situation, the kind of logic of the situation, the mere possibility of somebody else having a desire that can with us. This is enough to lead us to distrust other people. So in the first case, the first instance, there is some scarce resource. There's an actual conflict over some scarce resource. Conflict, conflicting desires that cannot be satisfied. But now Hobbes is saying, just knowing that that's a possibility, knowing that we might come into conflict with somebody in the future, even before we actually have that conflict. Knowing that, 
if we do come into conflict with somebody else, there's not going to be any way to resolve it except by fighting. That knowledge, I say one more time, even before there is a scarce resource, even before there is a conflict of desires, that knowledge that if there comes to be one, there won't be any way of resolving it except to fight. That's enough to get us to fight now. That's enough to get us to anticipate the possibility of conflict and to take preemptive measures. This is enough to get us to want to protect ourselves, especially our lives, from fighting. And the way to do that is attack now. Don't wait until there actually is some conflict between two different people's desires. That's dangerous. So what you should do now is as it were, assume that there might be a conflict, and if you're assuming that, then the best way to protect yourself, the best way to satisfy your most important <coughs> desires, most importantly staying alive, is not to wait around until a fight breaks out, but to <coughs> attack now. So, paragraph three, uh, sorry, paragraph four. And from this diffidence, distrust of one another, there's no way for any man to secure himself so reasonable as anticipation. That is, by force or wiles, to master the persons of all men that he can, so long till he see no other power great enough to endanger him. And this is no more, he says, than his own conservation requires, and is therefore generally allowed. <coughs> third point, sort of reinforcing this. And also, here comes the third point, and also he says, because there are some, there be some, some people, not everyone, but some people that take pleasure in contemplating their own power in the acts of conquest, which they pursue farther than their security requires, well, if others should not, should not by invasion increase their power, they would not be able for a long time by standing only to their defense to subsist. Okay, so third point is that there are some people, i say one last time, not everybody, um, who simply have a direct desire, a sort of ground level desire, to dominate over others. Um, some people take direct pleasure in glory, or what he calls sometimes vain glory. I say again, maybe not all, maybe not even many people, but some. And, well, if our strongest desires are to protect our own lives, just knowing that there are some people out there who have a direct desire to dominate over us, well, this is enough to make us distrustful. This is enough to um, get us to um, be distrustful of others and to want to defend ourselves. So one of the great problems in the state of nature is its uncertainty is not knowing when exactly uh, a conflict will break out over some scarcity in the future.